Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We are in Romans chapter 8. We're going to pick up in verse 10. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through His Spirit who lives in you. Huge implications of this text. We're talking about walking in step with the Spirit every day, listening to those promptings of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit invites you to pray for something, the Holy Spirit invites you to bring up a conversation with someone, the, the Holy Spirit invites you to make a wrong right. The Holy Spirit tells you, hey, this is a bad idea. And the Holy Spirit says, now it's time for worship. And you're like, no, but I'm here on, I'm, I'm right here on I 90 and it's backed up past exit 17 and the traffic's insane. Everybody's honking at me and like, no, this is the time to worship. That Holy Spirit, walking in step with the Spirit, gets us through every day and the ultimate re result is life and peace. But what about on the other side of mortal life? What about the day that this flesh finally dies? This takes the scope and the scale of the promise of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives to an eternally different scale. All right, this raises the stakes. This is what the Holy Spirit of God is going to do for us the day that we die. This is like a funeral text. If you know someone whose life has been marked by the Holy Spirit of God, you know this person is saved. I've preached a lot of funerals, and I never preach anyone into heaven or hell because I can't say with any authority, but I can tell you firsthand, it sure works a lot better when you lead a life that is overflowing with the fruit of the Spirit such that everybody's like, yeah, obviously that person's got to be saved, right? And on what basis do we make those assumptions? There are assumptions. We don't know them for sure. It's possible to fake us all out. You could trick everybody if you want to. Christians are pretty good at making masks. But when somebody leads a life that is overflowing with the fruit of the Spirit, they've kept in step with the Spirit every day of their life. Where do you think they go in death? Man, that is actually a celebration. Those are actually, in a way, happy funerals. And I've done funerals for non-Christians. They are not at all happy affairs. All right, look at this text. If, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. What did we say? Following Christ means taking up your cross every day. If you slay the sin nature and you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Because keeping in step with the mindset of the flesh, doing what your flesh wants you to do, all right, being slothful, drinking too much, doing drugs, cheating on your spouse, looking at pornography, what your flesh wants you to do, obtain more worldly possessions and take pride in those things. Put an outward appearance that looks impressive to other people that just by fleshly standards makes you look cool. If you continue in these ways, that mindset will ultimately lead to death. But if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. It's taken as granted at this point that you have, you have put to death the deeds of the body, but the spirit gives life because of righteousness. Now, this one can be difficult to understand. What does it mean to say that the Spirit gives life because of righteousness? There is a legalistic misinterpretation of this verse, and that is because you do righteous deeds, the Spirit gives you life. Oh, you did a good deed. I'm going to give you life now. All right, this gets the cart before the horse. The righteousness is that of Jesus. The righteousness that flows through our lives is the result of the Spirit of God within us. It's it, it, everything that's good within me is because of God. The good that comes from my life is because of the Holy Spirit of God at work in me. The good that you see in non-Christians as well is also the work of the Holy Spirit of God. They just don't confess Christ as Lord. They're not off limits for God's eternal purposes. See Caiaphas. See in our upcoming study in Isaiah, King Cyrus. Persian king, united the, united the Medes and the Persians, and set uh, the uh, set the set the Hebrew captives free from and, and brought them back to Jerusalem. See also Balaam, he was a pagan prophet for hire. He was he was a uh, he he was a freelance prophecy provider for the Moabites, but all he could do was bless the Israelites. All right, God can speak through whomever he wants to, but you as a Christian know the Holy Spirit on an intimate level. You know when the Holy Spirit of God prompts you to do something that results in an act of righteousness, it's not your flesh that did it. It's actually the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Now, if Christ is in you, the body's dead because of sin, but the Spirit 
gives life because of righteousness. It's not that you do righteous deeds and you earn the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit of God is within you, you're going to overflow with righteous deeds. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, okay, and we've already taken that as established in verse 9, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through His Spirit who lives in you. This means that your funeral is not actually the end of your life. Okay, spoiler, if you haven't been on the mummy ride in Universal Orlando, the mummy actually makes a fairly theologically accurate statement at a fake ending. The roller coaster comes up to these turnstiles. Everything seems to stop and there's this worker in the corner and then suddenly, boom, the glass busts and the ceiling catches on fire and this animatronic mummy is like, death is only the beginning. And it's like, I was like, actually the theology kind of checks out and then the roller coaster resumes. It's not far off, all right? If you're in Christ, death is only the beginning of a perfect eternity, perfect peace sinless surroundings, evil slain, death no more, no more crying, no more grieving, no more pain, a painless existence forever in the direct presence of God, similar to the way that it was in Eden before sin entered the picture. Now, Paul also wrote a letter to the Corinthians, and we've studied this before. I want to go back to that because in 1 Corinthians 15, he spoke about the substance of said resurrected body, All right? The promise here is that the Spirit of God, who also raised Jesus from the dead, living in you, is going to bring your mortal bodies to life one day. That's incredible. Here's how. What, am I, uh, what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, these sin-stained bodies cannot be in the direct presence of God. God said as much to Moses on Mount Sinai. Nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Right? Uh, this is what makes me sort of a, a self loathing mid tribulationist. This verse right here. I believe the last trumpet is the last trumpet, the seventh of the seven trumpets in Revelation that takes place halfway through uh, the tribulation. So if you can free me of uh, this mid tribulationism that I despise but I'm bound to because of these words, please do so. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. And here you're going to see a series of quotes. I want to leave the footnotes here. See this stuff? These footnotes? This is gold. Always read this stuff. He's actually going to quote from Isaiah 25, verse 8. That's the study we're going right back into uh, starting after next week. And then Hosea 13. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And now here, where death is your victory, where death is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, right? By the law, we become aware of our sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. By way of Jesus, we share in victory over death itself. We are, we are imputed with the righteousness of Christ, and so we are imputed with the resurrection of Jesus. We share in his burial through baptism. We share in his resurrection as well when we come up out of the water. Death has been swallowed up in victory. This verbiage of, of Isaiah is also building upon the original audience's understanding of, uh, of pagan mythology swallowing up the world. And it, this, is, this is eclipsing that, saying God is going to swallow death itself. And then we see that in the book of Revelation. We see death cast into the lake of burning sulfur. Sometimes that's equated with hell, but really that's actually the fate of death itself. So Paul describes in chapter 15 how, look, you got different you have different substances comprising the earthly body, you know, of, of fish versus other kinds of meat. You have the, like the, the stars have a different kind of glory in themselves in the same way that the moon is different from the sun. Our earthly bodies are different from our resurrected bodies. We just celebrated Easter and we saw the resurrected Jesus 
walking around into rooms that were locked, okay? We see him appearing to multiple people simultaneously all around one another. He appeared to the Emmaus disciples, and they were about seven miles away from the other people to whom he appeared, all right? We see that the resurrected Jesus is not bound by the things that these bodies are bound by. We are substantively changed uh, when resurrected. That's a powerful, powerful promise. But back to, back to this text of, of Romans chapter 8, Christ is in you, the body's dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life. Look at the full glory of the Trinity on display upon the resurrection of Jesus. We know Romans 10, 9, right? We know that... God raised Jesus from the dead. We see the Father, we see the Spirit, we see the Son, but where's the Spirit? All right, we see according to this, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, uh, the, the Spirit is the one who raised Christ from the dead. All right, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through His Spirit who lives in you. We know that we cannot say Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit of God. Look at the Trinity on display in all of its glory through the moment of the resurrection of Jesus and the moment of conversion in a Christian. It's really, really cool to see. So see to it that you don't serve some sort of dichotomous God, merely Father and Son to the neglect of the Spirit. Keep in step with the Holy Spirit of God every single day for real this time.